Hey, everybody. Uh, two amazing guests today, you know, for a change. Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney from the Northern District of Alabama, appointed by Barack Obama. Joyce uh, Vance, not related to Cy Vance, the Manhattan DA, who will no doubt be prosecuting Donald Trump on all matter of uh, tax and financial misconduct. I was so excited to have Joyce Vance on because she's a regular MSNBC contributor and always explains uh, complex legal matters in a uh, in a manner that I find especially clear and precise and incisive. I am honored as well to have Preet Bharara, the former U.S. attorney from the Southern District of New York, who was fired right at the top of the Trump administration, uh, like just about every other U.S. attorney around the country. But uh, first order of business had to be getting rid of Preet, uh, being in the Southern District of New York, which was, of course, Donald Trump's home, where he is suspected of committing any number of any variety of uh, crimes. Trump remains individual number one uh, to Michael Cohn's individual number two in the scheme to pay Stormy Daniels, an adult uh, film actress, and uh, Karen McDougal, a Playboy playmate, to stay quiet uh, about their sexual relations uh, with individual number one. That's Trump, not Cohn, individual number two. And evangelicals, uh, they were able to roll with that. Uh, And you can only imagine the myriad of other crimes that Trump may have committed within that jurisdiction. He is, of course, innocent until proven guilty. Let's not forget that. This is the United States of America. And Joyce and Preet and I uh, discuss whether President Trump can pardon himself and escape federal prosecution Uh, until maybe the Supreme Court finally says, look, I know you appointed three of us, but the president cannot pardon himself. Preet is uh, also the host of Stay Tuned, his podcast about all matters of law, uh, much in the last few years involving Donald Trump and his administration. Uh, Presumably that will change. But again, maybe not for a while. Anyway, uh, you're going to really enjoy uh, Joyce and Preet, you know, for a change. Boy, uh, this has just been a rough time uh, with COVID peaking all around the country. Uh, the new administration will be making a concerted effort to develop an effective federal plan to vaccinate Americans. And of course, we are all still in shock from January 6th, the invasion of the U.S. Capitol by these uh, MAGA white supremacists. They clearly represent a a danger greater than we had ever imagined, at least than I have ever imagined. They are violent and uh, racist and anti-Semitic, and it seems the more we learn, the worse it gets. Uh, Attacking Capitol Police with hockey sticks and flagpoles and fire extinguishers. Uh, They came to kill members of Congress uh, and hang uh, Vice President Pence, uh, all because they love Donald Trump. Uh, The Proud Boys, Donald Trump told them to stand by, and they did. Trump did everything you could to create this situation. Every other presidential nominee concedes when when it's time. Not only has Trump yet to concede, He still continues to tell his supporters that the election was rigged, that he won by a landslide, and to stand by. So he's been impeached by the House, and now the Senate is faced with some hard choices. Biden wants to confirm his team. And so what does the Senate do? You know, impeachment the first week? Uh, Confirm Biden's people? Uh, move quickly to pass a $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill. Now, I hear a lot of commentators, uh, senators, uh, reporters saying, you have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. I I just keep hearing that. I don't think those people understand the saying, walk and chew gum at the same time. It's easy to walk 
and it's easy to chew gum. That's the whole idea of the walk and chew gum cliche. He's so stupid, he can't walk and chew gum at the same time. See, that's an insult because it's very easy to walk and, and very easy to chew gum. It's not easy to have an impeachment trial. Billions and billions of people walk every day. This is the fourth impeachment trial in the history of the country. It, it's kind of important to do it well, and that is hard. It's a lot harder than walking. Now, the confirmation process is also harder than chewing gum. It takes a lot of reading through someone's records and, and, and their speeches. You know, it could be hard, but nowhere is hard as implementing an effective COVID inoculation program and getting the economy going in the meantime. That is so much harder than chewing gum. So when you hear members of the Senate or the press say, well, they should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, they are actually just completely confused. And I think making everyone in this country just a little dumber. That's a pet peeve of mine, the misuse of aphorisms. Come on, everyone. Using an aphorism correctly is as easy as walking and chewing gum at the same time. Just, just give this some thought, everybody. Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I just want to give a shout to Andy Slavitt, frequent contributor to this podcast, who has joined the Biden COVID task force. Uh, Andy, who's been on our podcast, I guess as much as anyone, is is the guy who saved the ACA website after it crashed. Uh, he did that in five weeks. That That was hard. And he signed up for four months on the COVID task force. So congratulations, Andy, and, and uh, I know you'll do a great job there. And finally, finally, I don't think many white supremacists listen to this podcast, and uh, that's the problem in this country. Not that you have to listen to this podcast to understand that diversity has always been the strength of, the, of this country. You get that other places as well. It's just... It's just that there are two universes of information. You've maybe heard me talk about this. Uh, the people who raided the Capitol are getting their information from very different sources than you and I. And, of course, one of the most pernicious messages that these people have been getting is that the election was stolen. And a lot of that came from our deranged president or ex-president, but... They've also been getting it from some of the most powerful Republican politicians like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, senators who, who tried to stop the certification of the rightful winner of the presidential election and throw it to four Republican state legislatures so that they could get their guy reseated. And these guys must be taken to task for that. These two were both clerks for Chief Justice William Rehnquist. Believe me, they know what listeners of this podcast know, that the Trump legal team went to court more than 60 times and proved absolutely no fraud whatsoever. The Republican judges who sat on panels in those cases insisted on writing the scathing decisions themselves so that everyone could see that federal society judges and Trump-appointed judges were saying that there was nothing there. But Cruz and Hawley kept repeating over and over again that there had been an unprecedented number of allegations of voting fraud that had led to an unprecedented number of Americans to doubt the outcome of the election. Well, that's because they kept repeating these allegations, even though they knew, they knew they were completely bogus. And that led directly to the raid on the Capitol. These guys should be expelled from the Senate. But first, they deserve a full investigation into their conduct. And that means the Senate should appoint 
an independent counsel to go through all their communications and interview all their Senate staff and campaign staff under oath, under penalty of perjury, and have access to all their emails. And in addition to that investigation, there should be public hearings in the Senate and the House with with sworn testimony. There is blood on their hands, and they should be gone. But first, we need to know everyone that they spoke to and the extent to which their fingerprints are on the Capitol riot. And if so, prosecution. There. Now on to Joyce Vance and Preet Bharara and an intelligent, uplifting conversation for a change. You want to start with impeachment? I mean, uh, some of these questions are not legal so much as political questions, right? Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think that's right. Joyce. Yeah. Okay, there it is. I, I should have asked a legal <laughs> question. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you want to get into it, but there have been arguments that I've seen or, or you know, discussions that I've seen and heard between and among legal experts about whether or not, you know, the, the, the statutory requirement of incitement is met or sedition, whether under federal law, there's now some reporting uh, I think out of the mouth of the D.C. Attorney General himself that he's looking at a particular incitement statute, and as I think we learned in the last go around of impeachment, what is a high crime and a misdemeanor is really not just an ethical question, but a political one. It is a political one, as opposed to doesn't ha- doesn't have to have actually <laughs> uh, committed an actual crime, right? You could Correct. do something awful like what he did, and like lying about the results of the election over and over and over again and calling the secretary of state in Georgia and threatening him, that kind of stuff, you mean? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Stuff that's basically in the heartland of abusive power and things that if they were done by you or me or Joyce or someone else who's, who are private citizens, doesn't have the same consequence and effect. There are things that if the president of the United States does them, like, for example, call up the president of Ukraine and ask him to do stuff or put the arm on people like the president of Ukraine or the secretary of state in Georgia, that has a huge consequence and a consequence that can be dealt with by the other branch of government as set forth pretty explicitly in the constitution. And it also highlights, I think, one of the shortcomings of the criminal justice system, not so much a shortcoming, maybe it's a a built-in safety valve. When you're going to lock someone up for their conduct you have to have this very high uh, level of certainty that they really deserve it, right? That, so that's why we use the burden of proof beyond reasonable doubt in the criminal justice system. Sometimes presidents do things where you might not necessarily be able to meet that high burden, but it's similarly incumbent upon us to, to keep them from doing any more damage, to get them out of, of office. And so the abuse of power uh sort of rubric that's used for impeachment makes a lot of sense traveling alongside the criminal justice system when you're talking about a president. Yeah, it's not it's not a criminal procedure. It's a it's a disciplinary action like you would have in a company. It's basically saying, should the CEO go? And in certain circumstances, even if it's not a crime, the CEO or a member of the board of directors or another executive has to go. But to that to all this point about evidence about you know, a trial and stuff, you'd think you'd want to call witnesses, right? For example, in the last one, how many votes were there for witnesses? Two from the Republicans? Yeah, not a lot. That's a disgrace. Call me old fashioned, but I always like to know the truth before I make important decisions. I guess that's gone out of fashion. No, you're a U.S. attorney. And I think that discipline, uh, but a lot of these guys weren't, but some of them were. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them were uh, clerks uh, for the, the uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court. I'll come back to some questions about Trump, for example. The one effect you might have on him is make it so that he can't serve again, right? If you call what he did serving. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> disserving. <laughs> there, are, there are three things really going on here, right? One is impeachment, which is merely a majority vote in the House in favor of lodging an allegation, right? Separate and distinct from that is the next phase, which is 
a trial in the Senate for which you need a two thirds majority uh, to convict. And then separate and apart from that, and part of the reason they're going through with this is under Senate tradition, you then can have a subsequent vote to disqualify that person if they've been impeached and convicted disqualify them from serving again in a position of honor. They have to be convicted in order to do at, at that. Least, of at least one article of impeachment, yes. Right. I see. Because that, that's essentially the punishment, right? Um, or, or an additional punishment. So conviction results in you are going, being removed from office. Uh, and, and this other thing has only been done, a couple, I think, only a couple of times in American history. But there is language in the Constitution with respect to disqualification from future office. And to do that, to, to impose that additional punishment, you got to take another vote, which I think most people think only needs to be a majority vote in the Senate. Joyce, do you agree with that? I think that that's right. And that's one of the reasons that even if, you know, we've we've heard sort of dueling plans this week, even if the impeachment vote, or rather not the impeachment vote, but the vote in the Senate doesn't take place until Trump is out of office, it makes sense to go ahead and do it just to, to bar him from serving again. And I think the timing of this politically, if I'm Joe Biden and I get sworn in on the 20th, I don't want there to be an impeachment trial the first day. I don't want there to be an impeachment trial the first 100 days. I mean, he's out. The guy's gone. Yeah, I mean, Joe Biden's going to need to confirm his cabinet. He's going to need to deal with COVID. On the other hand, you know, this is not a small piece, bit of business to deal with, uh, you know, holding President Trump accountable so I'm glad I'm not the one having to make this decision. <laughs> having to make the decision. I don't know well, which way it could go. Interesting questions like: Is someone going to show up and and knock on his door with an arrest warrant once he's out of office? Well, that's another question that I want to ask you in a bit. But I want to get to Cruz and Hawley, and maybe Ron Johnson or some of the others. I talked to Mark Elias today, who is a lead election lawyer. Um, he's written a piece about he believes there should be an ethics investigation. Uh, ethics process against these guys, I agree, and that they should appoint a special investigator. But in my mind, they should be able to, what they should be able to do is get the testimony of his staff, their, their testimony, of course, get access to their emails, anybody who they connected to that uh, was also perpetrating these allegations, which they knew were false, right? Remember, their their document says, well, there's been an unprecedented number of allegations of fraud in this election. Well, yeah, you made them. <laughs> you made the allegations, exactly. It was that moment where Cruz said 39% of the American people think that President Trump won the election, you know, and because there's this dispute... And as you say, this, I think, is a central moment that shows that they know that everything that they were saying was not true because they had generated that belief in the 39 And they probably chose their words very carefully instead of saying, at least then, that the election was stolen. They just kept saying that. So they couldn't be held to that. But I would love to know what their emails were. And I would love to... You know, they had to know there there were 60 trials, right, or 60 court cases. I think more, yeah. even more. Well, 62 now, I guess, that, that Elias have won, <laughs> has won. Yeah. The one they lost, of course, was to shorten the uh, number of days you could cure ballots in Pennsylvania. That was their big victory, right? So these guys knew what they were doing, and they were trying to steal the election, this is really serious stuff. Well, I think you're right about seeing all of their communications. And I'm sort of agnostic about who goes first, whether it's congressional oversight or federal prosecutors. But what I think is shocking, and maybe this is a certain amount of naivete on my part, is that instead of being in any way apologetic for what they've done, because as you say, there is no doubt that they knew that it was all a bunch of bunk. They have doubled down and they want to give off, I think, a real stench calling people, we need unity. We need to come back together. And that, I think, is just such a fraud to perpetrate on the American people. There has to be accountability. Well, the bizarre thing is they've, they've forfeited a responsibility to be true to their own branch of government. I mean, part of what's so heinous about what happened here and why it's impeachable and why people are so upset in Congress, at least normal thinking people 
is that the President of the United States and two or more of their colleagues basically turned a mob of folks who could foresee, who were foreseeable to be violent on the legislative branch of government. And even after that violence, and even, even after seeing footage that shows how close Mike Pence was to harm's way and Nancy Pelosi and some others, they're standing by what they said before, and as Joyce says, doubling down. That, that's kind of crazy to me. These guys, man, the Senate better better investigate these guys uh, in, in an independent uh, investigation to look into what they knew, who they were in league with, and, and I, I think they should be expelled. Well, I know some former U.S. attorneys who would do a great job with that kind of thing. Okay, well, um, good, good. I'll make some recommendations <laughs> to some former former colleagues. Okay, let, let's uh, talk about... Uh, le- Can I ask you a question, Senator? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when people do that to me on my yeah. podcast. But since I have you, I'm dying to mm-hmm. know how y- what you think your Democratic and Republican former colleagues think about Ted Cruz and his conduct, whether or not they'll, they'll vote to do anything serious like expulsion, and whether they like uh, they, they dislike Cruz more or Hawley more? Well, I don't know Hawley, but my guess would be they dislike Cruz more because they know him better. Uh, this is what I have said about this, is that I probably liked Ted Cruz more than almost any of my colleagues, and I hated Ted Cruz. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> I mean, he is such a despicable person. It's crazy. By the way, Preet, I'm sorry, because I watch MSNBC quite a bit. I love Joyce. I like you. I so like sorry. you. I love Joyce. Well, I'm glad. Thank you for that. Well, you are. So, <laughs> I love the way you very dispassionately lay out everything on on uh, w- when you're when you explain shit uh it's it's uh, brilliant always brilliant always clear so let let's uh, i'll ask you this uh what kind of uh vulnerabilities does donald trump have after he leaves office in terms of uh, legal vulnerabilities and also the get gets us to the self pardon and uh i know i think i've heard a lot of uh, legal people say you well, you can't pardon yourself because the 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 precept or the concept is that no one can be a judge in his own thing. but if he does it uh, who's going to say no you can't do that well that's a good place to start cuz i think the answer to the question you know where does he have legal trouble is where doesn't he have legal <laughs> trouble he's got criminal problems federal and state i think the new york attorney general is going to nickel and dime him to death. I think she's probably getting ready to, you know, launch death by a a thousand cuts with um, sort of administrative sort of attacks on him. And so obviously we all know at this point that if he does self-pardon at best, that only helps him out with federal criminal cases. I don't think it helps him out even there. I think the, you know, legal scholars, I am not one, I just play one in the classroom, but real legal scholars who've studied this have done, I think, a really finely tailored analysis, making the point that you raised, which is that no one can judge their own case. No man can be above the law. If a president could pardon himself, he could crime for four years, pardon himself on the way out the door, and effectively being above the law. It makes no sense, especially because the founding fathers had such explicit conversations about this risk, chose to adopt the pardon power anyhow. It's clear to me that it doesn't apply to a self-pardon. But how does that get tested? It only gets tested, frankly, if a president gets charged by the federal government and asserts a pardon as a bar to being prosecuted. So an interesting question here, I don't think DOJ would indict Trump just to to test the legal theory, but you really don't want to have a standing precedent out there that says that a president can pardon himself. And I think DOJ would be forced to take some action, maybe re-upping the Office of Legal Counsel memo saying that you can't self-pardon, although that would be awfully weak sauce. And we know that there is at least a strong appearance that the Southern District of New York has a case, the Michael Cohen case, where Trump is an unnamed, unindicted co-conspirator. So maybe it would be game on. 
Right. And then, again, he would assert, no, I pardon myself. And then somebody has to make a decision. And Does that go to the Supreme Court? It, it ultimately ends up in the Supreme Court, I would think. Well, you know, you pointed three of them. <laughs> but that didn't help in well, the didn't bogus. didn't help him so much yeah, last yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so there, but the, then there's this, always the state, as you're saying, the state attorney general, and then uh, Cy Vance, uh, not related to you, right? Not related to me. I'm, I'm from the snake handling branch of the Vances down in the South. You're from the South. My husband is. I'm a California girl, but the Vances are, are snake handling Baptists. <laughs> How did you end up in the Northern District of Alabama? We went to law school together, and uh, I agreed to move down here when we got married. But Birmingham is a wonderful place. If you like barbecue and people who like to have fun and I know love, how to do football, there's yeah. nothing better. Big Bob Gibson's? Big Bob Gibson's, yes. It's one of my favorite barbecues. It is the best. Oh, God, I love Big Bob Gibson's. <laughs> that was Judge Heflin, Senator Heflin's favorite barbecue. He had a weight problem, too. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder. Uh, man, oh, man. Go down there and tell them Al Franken says you guys are the best, okay? I will. Yeah, please do. Oh, man, that place is great. Um, okay, ba back to the law. Yeah, I mean, and uh, so there's his taxes, <laughs> and there are, that that's what Vance is on. And can can the stuff that the Southern District found— this is a good question for you guys. The stuff that the Southern District found when they raided uh, uh, Cohn's uh, office or whatever they raided, and home or whatever, can they, can they give that to the state of New York? Can they give that to Cy Vance? It depends on, on various things, depending on whether or not Cy Vance needs it. There are provisions by which the feds and the state folks share information all the time. If it's grand jury material, that presents an obstacle and you have to get a court order to be able to share grand jury derived material with local prosecutors. But as to other materials that were seized, documents and, and whatever else, there are mechanisms by which you can do that. Absolutely. But one thing that I would say is that provision for getting a court order from a judge speaks in terms of need and it's discretionary with the district judge. I've actually had to go through that process a couple of times. And so if you were involved in a situation, and I'm just spitballing here, where, say, federal prosecutors felt like they were being blocked from pursuing a case or there was some other impediment, I think you could get a judge to sign the order. The other issue, though, is he was his lawyer. So, you know, with respect to material that could be deemed attorney-client privileged material, you'd have to be careful. There are ways yeah. around that, including by making arguments that there, it was not actually material generated in connection with representation, which sometimes happens with lawyers who are corrupt <laughs> with their clients and also just invoking the whole the whole notion of, of the crime fraud exception. You can't commit a crime with your lawyer uh, and then shield those materials as well. In fact, this, was, this would happen a lot in mob cases. You'd have the lawyer for the mobsters join meetings and they, the hope would be that the mere presence of someone with a law degree who was, you know, ostensibly advising the, the organized crime family would shield all those communications and it doesn't work that way. So we're gonna we're gonna knock off Vinny. And you're a lawyer, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is <laughs> this is fine, right? Can seek a legal area? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So okay, that doesn't work. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Uh, let me let me go to um Merrick Garland. I want to go to Merrick Garland because I was so moved by his speech. Did you hear his speech when he was announced? Yes, and the others. It was really who are great. Of ours. Yeah, it's a kind of a, it's kind of different, isn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, but do you think that that Biden didn't pick him until he figured out that they won both seats in Georgia? No, I think he. I think I, mean, I don't know. Uh, I have friends who are involved in transition, but you know they keep their things close to the vest. Maybe Joyce knows more. I think he made up his mind in advance because Merrick Garland happens to be one of the people who, given the group of folks being talked about, uh, was probably fairly confirmable. I um, think he was confirmable. The question is, he leaves a vacancy on the circuit, right? My understanding is that, that regardless of whether he was nominated to be the attorney general, that there was a substantial likelihood, if not a certainty, that he was going to go senior status, which would create the vacancy anyway. 
I see. Oh, okay. Well, that's a wrinkle that I didn't think of, and that's an important wrinkle. Yeah. I see. So it just was a coincidence that it was <laughs> it wasn't announced till uh, uh, Asaf won. You think? I think. I think so, Joyce. I think that that's right. It, it felt like that decision had been made. And look, there were three great candidates. Preet and I both worked with Sally. Um, she's tremendous. I've known Doug Jones for 30 years. Think really highly of him. He's Alabama as well. He's an Alabama course. guy, my old boss. Merrick Garland just signals such a strong commitment to institutionalism um, and to restoring the Justice Department. And that really, I think, makes him a brilliant choice in this moment. Oh, I do too. And then, of course, the history is a particularly sweet in a way or ironic or bittersweet, maybe. And people shouldn't miss the, the, the importance of the number two and number three, two of my close friends. And I know friends with Joyce also. Lisa Monaco, who will be the number two, the DAG. Uh, and Benita Gupta, who will be the associate, are both tremendous lawyers, passion advocates for doing the right thing, understand what it means to be independent. So it's not just Merrick Garland at the top. Uh, it's the rest of them, too, so far that have been announced. Give me a lot of hope. Gupta was head of civil rights, right? Yes. She was never yeah. confirmed. She was the acting, but she did a tremendous job. She really moved everything forward. And what was Lisa Monaco before? Lisa Monaco's had a, a long career, 15 of, of her adult professional uh, years of her life were spent in the Justice Department. She was former um, chief of staff to Bob Mueller. She was an aide to Janet Reno. She was an assistant U.S. attorney in D.C. She was the uh, principal associate deputy attorney general. Then she was the first woman to be confirmed to be the assistant attorney general for the National Security Division. I feel like I've memorized her resume. She, she yeah, she wow. A That's she owes me a dollar or two. And then, and then at the end, she moved to the White House and was the uh, counterterrorism advisor to President Obama. So she has a pretty spectacular, broad-ranging set of experiences that suit her for this job. I think it's really important, though, to say that Lisa is a prosecutor's prosecutor. She worked on the Oklahoma City bombing. She knows her way around the courtroom. So I, I suspect if you cut Lisa in the arm, she bleeds DOJ blue. Wow, this is an impressive group. And what a contrast. <laughs> <laughs> What we've had, you can, man, oh, you can man. say that again. <laughs> no, but but it's a it's a double sided contrast, right? The the way I think about it is, it's it's both the case that these people who are coming in are saying the right thing, and that's why you and I and others have been moved, and they talk about independence. But it's also that the president elect himself is saying those. Imagine Donald Trump ever saying, "The attorney general is not my lawyer. The attorney general is not supposed to." Where's be, my uh, Roy Cohn? <laughs> Where's my Roy Cohn? So it's on both sides. It's the president saying the right thing and meaning the right thing, and then it's the people who he appoints meaning the right thing. And so long as the, and, and in, in the prior administration, I mean, the, I guess the current administration that's coming to a close, you had both sides doing the wrong thing. You had the president saying, "Where's my Roy Cohn?" and you had Bill Barr up until the very last minute, you know, basically acting like he was the lawyer for the president. So it's a huge sea change. Man, oh man! So Barr. What a horror he was. What were his worst crimes? M mischaracterizing Mul the Mueller report? I think his worst crime was adopting the mantle of being the president's lawyer, not the people's lawyer, and replicating that over and over in ways big and small. That's the general principle on which all that crap went down. Yeah, and, and then he did other things. He did smaller things that maybe because of my parochial interest, loomed larger. And I think we're also going to find out other things that both he did, the president did, and other members of the administration did that we don't know about yet. And I think some of those things will be bits of conduct that are happening as we speak, you know, in connection with covering up the insurrection or leading up to the insurrection and whatever future violence is going to happen between now and January 20th. But this whole business of uh, Bill Barr lying about whether or not the Southern District U.S. Attorney, my successor, was voluntarily stepping down or was being fired is not a small thing. And it, it bespeaks an interest in interfering with the independent operations, not fully independent, but somewhat independent, appropriate arm's length operations of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. And then there was also his interference in Roger Stone and Michael Flynn and in the doings and workings of the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. So, you know, his hand was there when it benefited the president. and. That is not a small thing at all. Is there, is there any chance that he'll be 
sanctioned in any way? You know, it's an interesting question. What made him resign in the way he did? What conduct was too much for Bill Barr? And and not to get too far ahead, I think Preet is right. There's conduct that we don't know about yet. And whether or not his resignation, in essence, took the form of withdrawal from a conspiracy is an interesting question. But Barr is a smart lawyer. And I would have expected, I say that advisedly, smart in the sense that I would have expected him to insulate himself from any sort of actual liability for misconduct. But I sure would like to have access to him as a witness. I would have liked to have put him in a grand jury multiple times and and see what he would say, because he is not the president's lawyer. There is not an attorney-client privilege there that could be exerted to keep him from testifying. Hmm. And what what setting might that happen in? Well, I, I mean, you would have to have a good faith for believing that he had evidence in something that you were investigating to put him in front of a grand jury. So I say it whimsically now, but I think it's not entirely out of bounds to think that Bill Barr will be a witness at some point in one of these cases, you know, that we contemplate on the horizon for the president. Preet, do you think, am I overblowing that? I mean, I really do. No, I think, I think that's true. I, but I do think the likelihood, I think the likelihood of sanction of him, given probably how he covered his tracks and how he's probably careful in his language and what he did, he probably escaped sanction. But, you know, we don't know all that. We don't know. I keep referring to this this concept of excavation when Trump leaves office. There's a lot that needs to be looked at and turned over and exposed because God knows what all conversations were taking place. God knows what all things the president was asking to be done that were either followed up on, you know, or not. But, but it still goes to the mental state and the misconduct potentially of Donald Trump. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Cipollone, is that how you pronounce yeah. his name? He is the uh, White House counsel, right? Yes. And yes. lately he's been, I understand, uh, telling White House staff not to talk to Trump. <laughs> Have you heard that? I saw the reports. Reported, I saw yeah. the reports. Okay, and so presumably that's because why? Why don't? You, why do you tell the president's staff don't don't talk to the president to avoid <laughs> being asked to do something that you shouldn't do? I, I suppose. And I wonder if he's also saying, and if you do talk to the president, please tape it. You know, the Secretary of State in Georgia was very wise and self protective to do that taping. You know, about two years ago, I tweeted this. I said, now is not the time for the Joint Chiefs of Staff to take the nuclear codes away from Trump. Now is the time to give him the wrong codes. (laughs) Somebody said that that aged well. Uh, It has aged very well. (laughs) As they say. Uh, I tweeted today that uh, Susan Collins said, we don't really have to take the nuclear codes away from him because this time he's really learned his lesson. Do you know who did not tweet today? Who? Donald Trump. That's right. Doesn't it make your morning so much better? You don't have to wake up and look to see what horrible new things he said. Although I'm of a mind with some people who are worried, you know, now we don't know what that guy is doing or thinking. (laughs) (laughs) That was never helpful to anyone's mental health. They they have taken the code away from him, or they have given him the wrong code, right? I mean, right? I didn't get the memo. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Let me ask you about the Georgia phone call. That really seemed illegal. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that really, really. I also wonder how. What, if what, how many? It was eleven thousand seven hundred and eighty that he asked for. Yeah, I think so. Yes. So he could win by one. What would that have looked like? Stealing an election. He did, it didn't matter to right? him. It would have looked like what it was, <laughs> stealing an election. But that's what he was asking for. So the Secretary of State is supposed to come do a press conference and said, uh, turns out the president won by one vote. <laughs> and, and they go, well, let me what? ask you, <laughs> if the Secretary of State in Georgia had been Josh Hawley, how would this have turned out? Well, then you'd also need the Secretary of State in Arizona and in Wisconsin yeah, well, and in Pennsylvania, I guess. But So what should happen to Josh Hawley? Should he get his law license taken away from him? I mean, in addition to being kicked out of the Senate? Well, look, I, I think, as you said earlier, an ethics investigation seems appropriate. And, and as I know Joyce will agree with this, you know, it can be interesting 
and uh you know a sort of um fun exercise sort of to opine on, on what should happen to someone without knowing all the facts but, but i think there's a lot to learn about who was having communications with whom mm -hmm. how much knowledge people had how foreseeable it was that there would be violence um, and it looks like it was more foreseeable than was earlier thought because of all the postings on parlor and in other places and and once you get a better understanding of what Hawley and the other senators knew what they said behind the scenes, not just on the on the floor of the Senate and at press conferences, and you take a look at what the motivations were, then I think you, get, you can get closer to an answer to the question, what should happen to him? You know, I think that's right. And I have to add one other thing I'm really interested in, because I, I think the essential thing here is to get to the truth, is who was talking to who? What was the chain of connection? Were senators talking to the White House, and if so, who, or to family members? And were they also talking back down to people who were organizing, people who were ultimately part of the mob that went into the Capitol building? There are a lot of relationships here that I'd like to know much more about. And then, by the way, the, the reaction of the president after, you know, during is relevant to his state of mind, right? It'd be one thing if the president said what he said, right? You know, fight, you got to be strong go to the Capitol, I'm coming with you. And then upon seeing the violence, he recoiled in horror and and is is uh, heard to be saying by his aides, oh my gosh, I didn't intend for that to happen. This is terrible. This is horrible. They're chanting, hang Mike Pence. Instead, the reporting suggests he didn't want to call them off. It took him a long time and it was almost forcible what he said when he finally made the video. Uh, and instead, looks like he was kind of enjoying what they were doing. They were fighting for him, even though there were clearly scenes of violence at the Capitol, at a co-equal branch of government. That is relevant to the state of mind he had when he said the things he said. And who would testify to that? I guess people who are around him then. I'm wondering who those people are. Well, Senator Sass has, has come out and said he was told that. So I guess you could just figure out who he was talking to. But he quoted language. You know, the president was delighted when he saw people beginning to go into the Capitol. Yeah, and he was trying to call senators. Did he, didn't he, didn't he, he get the wrong Tupper. senator on the line? He, he tried to call He was trying to get Tupper. Yeah. And who did he get instead? Not sure. Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> I <forgot he> got <laughs> Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> uh, hey, coach? No, no, it's Elizabeth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's the professor. Oh, I confused the coach. And, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, so what is he guilty of? Is this what is sedition and what is treason? And what is uh, what did he do? What, what I mean, if, if if the report is that he was enjoying this, and by the way, I understand that he didn't call to find out if Pence was okay. You'd think that during this he'd go like, I know that they were thinking of hanging the vice president. I wonder. Maybe he didn't know that, <laughs> but maybe he did. And I was like, I wonder if he... Didn't the end always have to be Trump turning on Pence? It, yes, of course, of course. But now Pence won't even turn on him. That, this is the 25th Amendment. Let's talk about the 25th Amendment. Um, what do you have to do to prove you're crazy? That's a legal question. <laughs> I think you've got to have a vice president whose backbone is intact, and we apparently don't have that. And not just the vice president, but other members of the cabinet several of whom left, and the speculation is they didn't want to have to make that vote. And who gets the vote? Are, do you have to have been confirmed? How, who who on the cabinet? Because a lot of these men and women, I don't think, maybe are officially secretary of, right? In fact, there was talk at one point that Trump was intentionally not getting cabinet members confirmed because of that. But, but I would have to say, I think <laughs> that the law is... Not clear, although the better view is that you have to be Senate confirmed to get a 25th Amendment vote. But but there is, I think, it's fair to say there's some argument on that point. And also procedurally, it's a bit cumbersome. And although it's quick in the overall scheme of things, it's not quick enough. You know, there's this provision that makes clear that the vice president convenes and writes a letter to Congress. Then the president has some time to say, no, I disagree. I am of sound in mind and body. And then there's another period of time. Uh, <laughs> For people to figure out what's going on. And so it's kind of a game of ping pong that takes place over some weeks. And, you know, in the overall scheme of things, that's quite quick. But when the guy's only got nine days left in office, it's a bit long.
But, you know, even given the ping pong, I mean, Preet, if you and I were voting, right, it would be too, oh, Trump is crazy and he's got to go. It's just not a close call. And the question that I'm left with is, what are they so afraid of, even at this point? I just, I fail to understand this sense of terror that Trump seems to inspire in these people. Because if they stood up, if they banded together and stood up just once, he would not have the ability to, you know, come for them with a mob like he came for Congress on Wednesday. He can't even mean tweet anymore. <laughs> I think they should I think they should amend the constitution to have a to have a two strikes in your out rule. If you're impeached twice, you got to be out. It just seems to me that these people must be afraid of the mob. Look at what these people do at airports. There actually has to be some actual physical fear of these people. Well, and so many senators stayed silent too. That that I think is a is an interesting point. Because I mean, these are brown shirts. You know what's interesting to me, and I'm very very conscious of this and have been, is that I've noticed that Hitler comes up now. It was like the uh, and maybe part of it was some of the uh, shirts that those people were wearing. But you know, you never could say you never could mention Hitler or the Nazis. You could say Stalin. <laughs> you know, he's very he's quoting Stalin when he says the enemy, the press of the enemy of the people. But you could never. But now people are. And I guess because of the what the Reichstag and all that stuff is that why we're hearing hearing finally the the tie or the parallels. You know, I looked up the word push, and it said that a push was a failed coup. So maybe that's what's brought this back into the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you about a different thing, but this relates to uh, the president being banned from Twitter, kind of. To me, the the biggest problem we face in this country are these two universes of information that people get. I think we get a a source of information that is more or less accurate, (laughs) but the people that were... Uh, in, you know, that went into the Capitol, they get their information online, like from algorithms, Facebook, feed them stuff that'll keep them online. And so they get all this conspiracy theory and QAnon stuff. Uh, do you guys have thoughts, either of you, about Section 230? No. <laughs> the record re- may the record reflect that there was a long silence. <laughs> Okay, is was the long silence did that reflect that no we don't or or wow that's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Can I make one point that others have made and it, it goes to the bizarreness and and I don't know if it's intentional or if it's just general simple mindedness on the part of people like the president who say without a lot of analysis and rigor and thinking abolish section 230 abolish section 230 and what's you know smart people observe is if you did that and then you made these platforms liable for the things that are put on them, they're going to err in, in the direction of caution and small C con- conservatism. And it's funny, you would have the kind of results you're seeing now with respect to parlor. People will be running away from the kind of speech that Donald Trump and these other folks engage in. And so, you know, separate apart from legal analysis, as an overall outcome, these guys who are asking for that may not understand what they're asking for. I'm not saying you abolish 230. <laughs> I'm not saying like, okay, cross that out. It, it just seems to me it needs to be revisited. No? A, a big part of the issue here is that the internet and, and everything that happens online outpaces uh, probably both the understanding of Congress, right? Probably not a lot of folks there who are, at least in the Senate, who are early adopters and who are are really up on this. But it's also, I think, hard to have the law evolve as fast as the internet evolves. Certainly true on the criminal side of the house. But I think also with Section 230 and trying to figure out how this relates to more traditional First Amendment concepts, um, we, we probably have not invested in this conversation like we need to. Because, look, it's hate speech. I mean, you can't, there, there are limits to speech. You can't yell fire in a, in a crowded movie theater if there's no fire. And the stuff that we're seeing is, is hate speech. 
all the time, constantly. And that's what these people who invaded the Capitol, they thought that stuff was true. They thought that Democrats drink the blood of, that they're pedophiles and they drink those kids' blood. I mean, there's got to be some friggin' limit here. This has to be revisited. Anyway, it doesn't sound like something you guys are, have been uh, on top of, particularly, on because uh, you're on top of a lot of other stuff. Is that fair to say? Fair. Yeah, I haven't researched it recently. But, but this, this question of truth and lying and hate speech is, is bound up with this question of incitement to insurrection. And there's a reason why the Democrats went back to their draft and added the call with the Secretary of State of, in Georgia and talked about the pattern of lying because you don't you don't get this activity, you don't get this violence, you don't get this extremism unless you can build it on a bed of lies, both a bed of lies and and hatred and hate speech. And it all kind of comes together. And that that's why to me what Hawley did and what Cruz did and, and John, Ron Johnson with those committee hearings, that's what was so pernicious. That's what led to this was people who know better, should know better, continuing to repeat the lies over and over again when they knew, they had to know. I mean, Cruz and Hawley, I don't, Ron Johnson, maybe not. I mean, I, I know Ron Johnson. And he's capable of not knowing. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But Cruz and Hawley, they know that the election wasn't stolen. But they wanted they just want to get elected president because they're psychopaths. And that's all they care about. Can I can I ask you another question? Just my second question. Well, all these people okay. who say that Hawley that Holly has destroyed his political career. Do you I don't know. That? Yeah. People have a I way don't of coming know. back. No? This is why I brought up 230, because we're just, in, we have, it's, the cat is out of the bag. I mean, we, we, we live in a society now where a good chunk of people believe this stuff and all they're going to do, and the Facebook algorithms are all they are. They know you better than you know yourself. And their only thing they do is try to keep you on. And they know that a lot of people, the more agitated they are, the more they'll stay on, longer they'll be on Facebook, and the more advertising they can be presented with and pay for the Facebook executives and the stockholders. And we have a real problem here. We have a real problem here because you may be, you may be right. Hawley may have made the most brilliant move he could because he'll have that whatever, except he'll have to split it with Cruz. Evidently. <laughs> <laughs> the nutcase right, you know. Tell me about what, what happened with uh, Barr and the U.S. attorney there. He got – you brought that up and said it was a little – uh, a personal, well, we, but we know that, we, we know, well, it's personal just because I love that office and it has a reputation for independence so much so that its nickname is the sovereign district of New York, which not, not everyone loves that, but ah. there's a reason for independence. And we've discovered if you, if you let independence dissolve and erode, then people will not have faith that decisions are being made for the right reasons. And you start to believe that the president's allies are treated one way and the president's adversaries are treated a different way. And after a track record, of trying to distort the findings of the Mueller report and stick his hand in the Roger Stone case and the Michael Flynn case. There, I mean, I don't know what cases SDNY has been looking at, but it's not a good look when an attorney general with that track record suddenly has a, a meal or a conversation with a sitting U.S. attorney in the Southern District and basically says, you need to go. And they're thinking about putting in someone who I would presume they would think is more pliable and then when that guy refuses and says, no, I really don't want to go to Washington for a different job, Bill Barr lies about it and says in a statement that I think Jeff Berman heard about from the press for the first time, he's stepping down. Stepping down implies that, he, that someone is, is going to leave on his own terms. And that wasn't so. And Jeff Berman is a gentleman and doesn't talk about various things. But 
it's not it's it's a it's a terrible sign when the attorney general of the United States lies, and in particular when he lies about how he's trying to change significant personnel against a backdrop of trying to do the bidding of the president. So it all stinks. So that's why I don't understand why he isn't easy to sanction. Well, you know, when you lie to the public, that's not a federal crime. Uh, I don't even know. But isn't a lawyer not supposed to do that? Yeah. You know, the problem with all these guys is, you know, I, I take the word lie seriously and I consider it to be a fairly broad concept. And in the final year of the Trump presidency, I think members of the press did also. But there's a lot of use of weasel words, right? Even when he got that criticism then, you know, his his explanation, and maybe this doesn't fly with the, with the state bar, or maybe it does. He said, you know, it's a euphemism. <laughs> it's like <laughs> stepping down is totally consistent with, you know, being told you're fired. Being fired. And you and I know what real words mean. And what, and he also did the opposite, by the way, right? When the President of the United States used words like spying, and critics said, well, nobody did that. Like a court authorized wiretap is not spying. And, you know, there was no spying of, of the, you know, using that phraseology that you use. There you had Bill Barr sitting at congressional hearings saying, oh, spying is a perfectly good word. You know, right. it just, it's a colloquial word. So sometimes it's colloquial. Sometimes it's a term of art, whatever suits him at the moment. So look, it, the same is true going back to what we were talking about with respect to Hawley and Cruz. You know, they, they're careful to some degree. In what language they like? No, they didn't say, "Go and smash the windows of the Capitol." They didn't say, "Go and seek out, you know, members by by of these names, and string them up." They stopped short of that. That's why it becomes a little bit more difficult in a, in a criminal case to hold some people accountable. Well, that, that's but this what I'm suggesting is not a criminal case. It's a case for the Senate to have an ethics investigation, and I certainly hope that they do that on these guys and maybe some more of the, and I hope they do that in the house as well. Right. Well, and I thought that the New York state bar is finally going after Giuliani. So interesting question is whether that means that some of these other folks who have law licenses that they presumably want to hold on to might have to answer for their conduct. Just to be clear on that, I think some people are getting that wrong. As I understand it, it's not the state bar. authority. Uh, it's the New York State Bar Association, uh, which is a voluntary okay. bar association. Sorry, I misunderstood uh, that. And yeah, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, Jesus it's very confusing. Christ. We can't there... rely on anything you say, Joyce. You know, just call me unreliable. Damn, Joyce. Uh, I wish you know uh, you'd lived up to your reputation of being reliable. I'm sorry to disappoint. But... <laughs> and Preet, very good, very good, good on you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. And really, you guys are so great, and I so admire and respect both of you. And I've just been a thrill to have you. I, I really mean that. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.